These conversations were recorded in the summer of 2020. We wanted to put artists who'd met through Green Man back in touch as we all try and navigate the fallout of the COVID-19 global pandemic. The results were so good that we couldn't not share them with you too. We hope they give an insight into how artists think, their experiences at Green Man, and what they talk about behind closed doors. Hi, I'm Sean Harris. I live in Wales, um, in Llangonog, which is at the other end of Powys from where Green Man takes place. Um, as an artist, I um, hop around media a little bit, but I mainly use animation, printmaking, puppetry, light, and sculpture. And last year, in 2019, I um, very significantly upscaled a work called Echo Maker and made another component for it, which Green Man commissioned, which was called um, Mimesis, which explored the ways in which humans imitate animal behavior in the pursuit of uh, cultural and environmental continuity. Um, Echo Maker and Mimesis were located um, in the woods behind the walled garden. Hi everybody, my name is Louise Beer and I am an artist and curator. I am originally from Aotearoa, New Zealand and I now live in Margate. Uh, as an artist I use installation, sculpture, moving image, sound and photography to try and bring a cosmic perspective to, our, to the way that we value nature. Hi, I'm Melanie King and I'm an artist part of Lumen Studios. Um, I'm from Manchester originally, but I now live in Ramsgate in Kent by the sea. And I work a lot with analog photography, printmaking, light, and um, using different sustainable photographic processes. And we have Becky who is just going to be showing her audio today. Hi, I'm Rebecca Huxley. Um, I'm based in London. I'm an artist and researcher. Um, I'm, I look at the political, social and ecological conditions of nighttime experience. Um, and I'm, I'm also a co-director of Lumen. So the Lumen Studios uh, Eclipse installation was in the forest next to the walled garden. And our installation was in 2017. We've prepared a short presentation to introduce Lumen, how we started in a couple of our projects and what's coming up. This is an image of our first ever exhibition at the Crypt Gallery in St Pancras. We were really excited about curating an exhibition with lots of different artists reflecting on themes of astronomy and light. So we created an exhibition of 30 different artists who were working with different things like printmaking, light installation and uh, photography. And all of these were exhibited in this crypt space in uh, St Pancras. So this is a image of the Lumen Gallery that we um, moved into in 2014 after um, having an exhibition in the church upstairs. This uh, crypt space we use as a gallery but we also use it to test installations so this is the first ever um, event that we ran at the crypt which was our launch and this was a uh, uh, beginning of the Eclipse installation that eventually was um, in part of Green Man Festival. So we used a big um, pin spotlight and a wooden circle and then projected directly onto the back of the crypt wall. And it was a really interesting uh, installation to be part of because you could walk around the whole thing um, and you could also see it from the entrance of the gallery. So in the gallery, we curate exhibitions with groups of artists, solo exhibitions, and also have artists in residence in the space. Over the past five or so 
five or six years, we have curated about 60 exhibitions as a group. So this is the installation that we presented at Green Man Festival in 2017. It was based on um, the eclipse that was happening at the time in America, more or less the same time as the festival. And we wanted to represent the eclipse within uh, Wales. So we made a 2.4 meter wooden disc and then covered that in reflective fabric, which is the kind of things that cyclists use on their um, jackets at night. And then we presented it with a, a stage light, which was extremely bright and used a gobo to make the disc. So it was a real challenge scaling up from the very small installation that we had in the crypt um, and then having the challenge of presenting it outside in this kind of forest location. The piece worked in the daytime and also at nighttime. And one of the surprising elements of the piece that we didn't expect to happen, which you only can tell when it's um, up in the situation, was behind the disc became a sort of void of light. So it became like a black hole in the trees, which is just incredible. Following on from the Green Man installation, we then made a new version of the installation, which was part of an exhibition at Vivid Projects. So this was again using a spotlight um, and a disc, but we were in an inside space again, which was much, much larger. So we filled the room completely with um, dry ice or haze, and then people were able to walk around the installation again in a kind of different fashion. Earlier this year, the Museum of Freemasonry commissioned Lehman to create a, a new piece of work for their gallery. This was a really wonderful experience because we got to look through the incredible collection of uh, historical items that reflect the changing views of the night sky throughout the time that the Freemasons have existed. So we have created this piece which also uses a ref hyper-reflective surface to end a projector and we use NASA imagery to depict different eclipses in space in the solar system. So this is an example of one of the objects within the museum that we took inspiration from. And we were really excited about all of the different imagery depicting the sun, moon and stars throughout the collection. So the next um, exhibition that we have coming up is with the Artist Expe Expedition Society in Australia. The, the exhibition includes about 10 or 12 artists from all over the world who will be participating in an exhibition at the Earth Sanctuary as part of the Desert Festival 2020 in Alice Springs in Australia. So here we've asked the artists to look at their relationship with the night sky. And the exhibition will be open from the 30th of September till the 2nd of October, but only to 20 people because of the virus. So the biggest audience that the works will have will actually be the night sky above Australia. We're very happy to say that we have Arts Council funding from the emergency grant and um, as part of this we are commissioning 20 artists to make a time lapse of the night sky from wherever they are in the world. So the idea is that we'll have a compilation of time lapses of the stars and we'll be able to see different views of the sky during the same month. Um, so it's really exciting and that open call is on until the 20th of August. So you can find out all of the information on our website. We have a page which is specifically for opportunities and we'll continue to update that. You can also find us on social media. So we have an Instagram, Twitter and Facebook and a mailing list um, which is on the front page of our website.
Right, so um, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an insight. Um, you can see behind me now, there's actually a, a still from, um, from the installation uh, from, from 2019 from Echo Maker, and you can see two birds um, flying along there. This work, which involves projection through multiple screens, is actually um, pretty difficult to document um, for, for, for posterity, um, largely because the way that the camera views um, something which flattens it is very different to the way the human eye sees it, um, which is something that um, is absolutely integral to the, to the work. I want to create experiences that are for that moment and can only be committed really to, to memory. Um, but anyway, you can see um, from the slide behind me, these two birds flying um, within this sort of um, beguiling optical world of light. Um, and they are cranes and uh, they were reintroduced to the Somerset levels uh, about eight years ago now as part of a species reintroduction program, which is very much sort of adopted by the locals there. They've actually now crossed the River Severn into Wales. And uh, so when Lexi and I began to discuss what this piece might be within the Green Man context, um, it was actually in the middle of uh, the Welsh government's decision-making process as to whether to build um, a very sizable relief road for the M4 through the Gwent levels, which is a very precious wetland environment, um, which the Somerset cranes had, had moved into. Um, so Echo Maker was originally made um, kind of in celebration of these returns to um, the Somerset levels became a piece with a whole new meaning because of this issue um, relating to modern society and its um, uh, perception of and relationship with the natural world. Um, I thought I'd give you um, just an idea of, of how it works technically, because what I do is to sort of marry very analog processes with digital technologies to create projected images and sounds and then um, a sculptural environment to actually make them into something very sort of three-dimensional. Uh, so um, I have here, again, looking at that slide in the background of those flying cranes, if you can see that there, that's a paper cutout of one of the wings of one of those birds. So this is a paper cutout of a crane flying or its body and there is sort of roughly where its wing would go and then in creating a sequence um, I would then so that'd be one frame take that one away and then there is another cutout which and this would obviously all be beneath or sort of on a rostrum camera and I made 22 different wings or wing shapes so I know a lot about the shape of a bird's wing now and how it sort of works there's another one and so on and uh, this is obviously how stop frame animation works we're sort of working our way through the movement of that of that wing um, and then we can loop it and that creates um, that puts the bird in flight basically when it's so this sort of loop of paper cutout shapes create this bird flying. Um, so just to sort of um, illustrate that a little bit further, I have here. Um, so I can can I uh, I'm going to give a plug now for the piece that's showing as part of Green Man's online event this year, which is called the Cave Hunters and the Truth Machine. Uh, in that the hyena is. Um, the central character. Most of my work involves around uh, or revolves around one creature or another. Um, and uh, so there, if you can see that, is the uh, paper cutout for a hyena in motion. So that moves just like a puppet. So again, I can create a looped sequence for that. 
um, and that creature will run for as long as I want it to. Um, but I also use um, objects from museum collections a lot um, and uh, I work with environmental organizations a lot and I have here from Echo Maker. You can see that um, I'm going to put the mandible down. It's in two parts. That's the skull of a crane. So this time last year, um, it's, it's exactly 12 months ago, an image of this um, was projected within the woods at Green Man. Um, three meters square on a scale at which I'd never actually worked before, which was very exciting, very exciting indeed. So that's sort of roughly how I do it. So um, looking at our respective works, we've all ended up with uh, essentially um, a circular artwork hanging up in the forest at a festival. So how, um, uh, I mean, I have very clear memories of, uh, of, of working all that out and finding it very exciting, but how did you, as a sort of a collective, find transferring a work that you'd evolved for one space into a very different and quite demanding space at, at Green Man? How did you find all of that? Um, I think it was quite a natural thing for us. It, it was something we'd also been planning to do for a long time. We'd each had experience of doing like large scale installations. So um, I think having that site visit with Lexi that first time um, was like, wow, this is an amazing place. Um, and you could sort of instantly visualize the piece that we'd already been talking about in that spot. Um, so yeah, I think the process and of sort of like bringing the work to site was quite a straightforward one for us. Um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else, Louise or Mel. I think it was really exciting to try and make a piece of work outside. Um, and it came with lots of factors that we hadn't really anticipated before, like heavy rain and winds and um, attaching to trees which are moving. So yeah, it was our first experience of working within that kind of landscape. And yeah, it was great to have that experience when everybody was sat around at night or in the daytime, just taking it in. And, and can I just add a, a sort of um, uh, another question there? Uh, one thing that when I started working outdoors a lot with the projection stuff, which would probably be sort of six or seven years ago now, um, the first bit about significant outdoor work I did was with a bunch of fire sculptors who did all of their work outdoors and they were so chilled about everything, <laughs> unlike a lot of artists that work in galleries all the time, because in a gallery you have an environment where you can exert control to the nth detail. But when you move outside, you sort of fall prey to what's happening and there's nothing you can do about it. How did you find that kind of, you know, the wind and the rain and, uh, and, and, and the sort of the possibility of all of that? Um, was it sort of nerve wracking initially or reasonably sort of chilled about it? It was a little nerve wracking just because it was such a big wooden circle. Um, <laughs> so we, I think we were a little bit worried, but I think all of the work that um, Lexi and the riggers uh, did really helped us to relax and understand mm. more about the process. Yeah, I think Le Lexi and the team helped us feel really confident about the install going well. I mean, the planning and preparation was really incredible, really detailed. Yeah. Um, we, all, we always felt supported in that process. So um, whilst you have to be somewhat adaptable and sort of work things out on site if anything needs to be adjusted, I think we always felt super confident that it was always going to look amazing because of that support and planning that we'd had. And another um, factor was working with such a big piece is that we didn't have anywhere to kind of test it 
um, before it was installed, test it in its full form. So we spent a lot of time with the huge, hugely powerful light in our crypt gallery, trying to create the installation in um, a much smaller scale. Um, but and so along with the kind of surprises came along the um, effect of an after image on people's retinas after looking at the piece as well, which was an amazing experience as well to, um, to create an image of a circle on people's retina for a couple of minutes <laughs> until it fades away. So as alongside the kind of scary things that happen that are unexpected and can't be accounted for before you're installing in a space like that. There's also really amazing surprises like the darkness behind the piece, the sort of void of light and also the effect on people's vision as well. Temporary effect. That's part of the power of working outside though, isn't it? You kind of, sometimes it can uh, work against you in ways that you could never have foreseen, um, mm -hmm. but more positively, I've always found that there are um, uh, positive impacts from the, uh, call it the dialogue between the work and its surroundings that you could never, never envisage. Um, and which um, I, I think is something that audiences really pick up on. And I think it's part of the power of that festival environment for the visual arts um, because of, of that dialogue with with surroundings everyone has this sense that this is happening right now and i'm seeing it um it won't be the same ever again and therefore it's a really um special sort of privilege to to be to be a, a part of this what were the unexpected um environmental impacts on your work when you put it up at green men well, the point that you made about not knowing whether it was going to, what, what the impact was going to be, uh, that, that's exactly what I found as the most sort of nerve wracking um, part of the whole process until it's kind of like you sort of flick that switch with this sort of humongous projector. Um, it's all, you can do it on a smaller scale, um, which I did. Um, you can do all of these tests, um, but until, that lamp comes on it's all a hypothetical so you can kind of do all you can to reduce the known unknowns um but there's just so much that you can't do and so um for me i remember the switch on moment um as as just sort of being a firstly a huge relief this <laughs> kind because of, the framework that um we built um like yours is very sizable it was five meters by three it's a steel frame suspended up in the in the canopy and again the the riggers that i had to work with were just lovely and and i'm sort of because that's a, a part of what i do for work i work with artists to realize things um i was sort of quite confident within that aspect of it um and and, and working with these guys who just defy gravity um, so I found all of that really, really exciting. But there's this gnawing feeling um, beyond the teamwork and the satisfaction of that, of, of this sort of moment that comes when it's all about you and that piece of work and that sign over there that's got your name on it with the name of the piece and everything like that. And it's, uh, you know, is this, is, is this going to work out? Um, but of course, you know, having... Lexi and the riggers and team who uh, and 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 I should also say um, of the other guys that work with Green Man who who um, sort of organised the equipment that we used. You're all collectively. Um, you got a pretty good idea that it that it should that it should work. So I was never eaten up with with nerves, but. Well, you know what it's like working with technology. You kind of there's there's always this stuff that that you you never imagined that you didn't know about before that, that that could go wrong. So there's always that sort of sense of that. But then 
I just remember, um, and it'll stay with me forever, I think, um, the, on the first night of the festival, um, it, you know, it all worked and we got it done in good time. So that was great. And sort of, and, and you know, it looked, it looked, I remember saying to Jim Brooke, the sound guy I worked with, God, that just looks like what I see in my head. I've never seen that look quite so close to the visions I have in my mind before, which is an amazing, amazing feeling. But then moving beyond myself to seeing, because we set up benches, so it became like a kind of a theatre um, within the woods, uh, or somewhere between a theatre and a cinema or whatever, uh, an installation. And all of these people just sort of um, really kind of flooding in around about 10 o'clock at, at night and sitting down to to watch it and you know i've done stuff in stuff projected in cinemas before um but quite often in a gallery you know on a day-to-day -day basis you might stick your head in there and there might be one person there or two people there so this sort of great flood of people um was just sort of quite overwhelmingly rewarding really and then um, the other thing with the festival environment at the other end of because my this piece ran from about eight o'clock at night till eight o'clock the following morning. And so when you go to switch the projector off at eight in the morning, eight in the morning, I find people asleep on the ground around it. Um, that doesn't really happen in galleries. That's <laughs> just okay. just amazing. Yeah, we had a we had a similar experience of um, going there at different times of day. Um, obviously, particularly at night, when you'd find people in various different positions meditating or in small groups convening to talk, and I often wondered what kind of conversations they were having under this like special light. Um, so yeah, it was an amazing thing to experience. I was going to ask you, Sean, um, another question, if that's okay. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, I was wondering how um, that experience and sort of witnessing all these people interacting the work and the whole experience of putting the installation in at Green Man, how that's sort of gone on to influence your work since um, and your, or your attitude toward your work, towards your work or um, any sort of future projects that you want to do. Well, I think the, the first thing to say is that I had a really amazing summer last year. I'd been working towards doing this kind of thing. And in animation, everything takes an age. Um, so um, last summer felt like the culmination of probably five or six years of work, um, uh, chipping away at the animation, evolving it. Um, the, the Green Man piece, had by some distance the best equipment it was the biggest and it had the largest audience um and and so in in terms of its impact um it really gave me confidence that this worked um the um it was worth i was part of the development conversation with lexi was about um because what i tend to do what i think we all do as artists is um, one idea sparks off a, a whole load of others. Um, certainly for me anyway, and your head becomes full of all this stuff and it becomes quite difficult to pick the path. And Lexi was great at actually sort of uh, keeping it focused. And, uh, and she said, um, why don't we just do a humongous projection? Because I had all this other, these other ideas about stuff that I would do. And that was absolutely the, um, I think it was the right call for the festival environment and that audience, but it was the right call for me as well, because it meant that we put all the resources into um, just the best equipment really that certainly has ever been brought to bear on my piece, which yielded dividends. And I remember looking at that and thinking, uh, and again with Jim, the um, composer that I work with, We'd never seen the work looking or sounding like that before. And you kind of think, oh yeah, this works. And then the other thing that's really important to say about Green Man specifically um, as a festival 
is that it, it, there's all this music going on and all this but you know science stuff in Einstein's garden and of course the visual art program but it's so much about the, the audience and the conversations that you have with that audience so this is going beyond the sort of the uh, you know Lexi stages um, various sort of seminar events which are great but they tend to as you'd imagine sort of attract the the, the more visual arts focused uh, aspect of the audience but the, the I just remember you know getting this piece running and switching it on every evening and switching it off at the end of it and in between just a mass of incredibly stimulating conversations about stuff and because it's like you guys you know you clearly have this sort of really underpinning engagement with science and astronomy within your work um as i do with archaeologists and paleontologists and environmentalists or whatever and there are so many of those people in the audience at green man and and they kind of all come out of the woodwork um, and, and so quite beyond the work itself, um, I came away with a whole load of other conversations in my head, um, which I can't quite sort of pinpoint now, but which were just so, so nourishing. And they were conversations beyond the visual art environment. Um, <clears throat> and 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 that's so important for us as artists i think because art is about life and the universe around us um and the best way to kind of therefore feed what you do is to go and engage with life beyond the the, the visual arts and um and green man presents this amazing platform for that it's very special in that way i think uh so the equipment um, uh, that I got to use, uh, this fabulous projector um, was provided by Limbic Cinema, um, who are based in Bristol, I think, and who do a lot of the animation stuff for the stages at the festival. Um, so again, you're through um, this festival environment, um, you're gaining access um, to, to real cutting edge expertise and equipment in that way, um, which I've, you know, the, I think, um, you know, I've done work with the National Museum of Wales and, and, and they've got a similar sort of access to, um, to some sort of pretty good equipment through, through Artis Mundi. Um, but I'm not sure that most of the galleries that I've dealt with have that level of equipment. So it's just a fantastic opportunity in that way. And because they're doing it all the time, because it's their job, they're just so sort of comfortable with it all. The one thing that looking at the image that's behind you of, of Eclipse and looking at the one that's behind me, um, that I think uh, is really unique about that location that we shared. Um, there's something just from a sort of um, an aesthetic point of view about that circular motif within all the verticals of of that plantation um and i wondered um uh if uh that had sort of struck you in the same way and whether you'd had the opportunity to to to, to develop that that further because it it kind of really works there's something about that quite alien crisp shape within those natural verticals yeah um so we really have used the circular motif quite a lot and um, it's part of also the lumens logo and we loved the fact that uh, the circle is quite a universal shape it's um something that is present in nature from the tiniest cell to the bubble the biggest bubble nebula which is like six light years across and yeah it's just a a really amazing shape to think of in kind of uh, a scientific level but also on an aesthetic level and yeah how the, the eye is a pinhole and having that um having that very 
uh, natural but geometric shape within the complexity of the forest is really exciting. Um, and yeah, we loved the fact that people within the festival also thought that the installation was a moon or a sun because um, it is quite a universal shape in space as well. I don't know if uh, the others want to add something to that. I think um, circles play a part in all of our practices and it was a real privilege to see something that we'd thought of as quite a sort of monolithic piece amongst the um, organic environment of the forest as well. We had some great conversations with people who, um, who'd who wanted to go and see the eclipse themselves and who hadn't made it. Um, and they really enjoyed having this experience, which they said was, they felt was almost as good as what <laughs> the real thing would be in their sort of imagination of it. So, I would like to ask a question for Sean. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit more about the mythology behind your work? Because um, I think that's a link between both of our pieces at the festival. Yeah, it, um, Echo Maker uh, of my work over the last probably five years is actually the least um, uh, mythologically influenced and I kind of um, within pretty much everything else that I've done um, this sort of um, uh, tension I suppose between scientific truth and uh, sort of mythical truth has, uh, has been absolutely sort of central to, to what I do um, but um, there's no sort of getting away from uh, the fact that Echo Maker is about this bird, um, which is seen universally as a um, as a symbol of um, of renewal and and rebirth. So I kind of took this in a very uh, uh, within a uh, contemporary societal context in in Somerset. Um, in that that's exactly what um, uh, uh, the the crane had seemingly sort of come to symbolize it. And yeah, I suppose this is it. Um, it, it, it sort of created, um, and this is actually making me think of some other stuff that I haven't thought of before. The crane has created a new mythology, in essence, in Somerset, um, which dovetails with its um, archetypal um, uh, symbolism as uh, as this sort of bird of heaven of uh, of renewal. Um, when you talk to people down in the Somerset levels, it was really striking how they all knew about these incredible birds, which have seven foot wingspans, um, and you'll see sort of fifty or sixty of them in the sky at one time if you're lucky. And because I did this work down there over the course of a year, I sort of saw them a fair bit but most people had never seen them and this only became apparent when you started sort of uh talking to people about this and, and asking what their sort of perception of the cranes was and, and then it became apparent that well, well well i've never actually actually seen one so you kind of had this sort of mythical being um uh out there in the the, the wetland landscape of the levels um, but which had, um, as has been the way with, with, with cranes all over the world and throughout time, um, become a, a, a symbol of, uh, in this case, of a renewed connection with, with that environment, which was always the RSPB's intention. Um, so um, in, uh, in most of what I do, um, this uh, the evolution of a scientific truth from a mythical one has been really really important over the last decade or so in my work but in this instance it's kind of interesting to dovetail um, uh, an archetypal mythological figure um, with this one that sort of created a, 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 
a new mythology in uh, in in contemporary Somerset landscape. I was just going to say that's really interesting. Well, it is, isn't it? I mean, it's just kind of, uh, and, and this is the, I mean, I'm fascinated by these mythologies sort of globally. I've just finished reading. It's interesting that you're off to Australia. Are you, are you getting, are you, you're going down there for that? Um, no, we are doing it all via um, collaboration. We're working with Anna Deccan of the Artist Expedition, Expedition Society, who's based in Alice Springs at the moment. So she is installing the exhibition over there. But it, oh. uh, the festival obviously was meant to be all um, with a physical presence, but it's changed a lot since coronavirus yeah, has happened. Yeah, I've just finished reading the song lines, just as uh, Bruce Chatwin's book, um, which is just utterly of of that place so I had that sort of vision of you all down there kind of in the middle of that empty 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 place but uh, sadly that's uh, that's not to be but um so so will that um uh is that something that you see as um uh, being an ongoing project or is this gonna is it gonna be a one-off in Australia yeah um I think it would be really interesting to for this to be the first of an you know, ongoing series of um, collaborative work with Anna. She, Anna is from the UK actually, and she moved over to Australia a couple of years ago. So she has worked with us before. She's been into the Lumen Crypt Gallery as well. And um, so she has a really natural understanding of what we do. And it's so amazing to be able to take that over to Australia to end not only just to Australia, but to the um, to Central Australia, with you know such a magnificent view of the night of the southern night sky as well. So yeah, hoping to work together more, but we'll um, we'll see how the future plays out. I guess <laughs> there's there's a really interesting sort of connection with, and it's the Artist Expedition Society, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So. Um, Chatwin's the song lines his his thesis within that so the book is exploring um, uh, the the concept of song lines and how maps of the landscape can be formed in, and held in the mind over over millennia um, and transcending many different languages um, across you know that 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 continent it's an extraordinary sort of idea. But Chatwin's thesis is that um, human beings are, um, we're evolved to wander, um, to, to, to constantly sort of be on the move. So there's something really resonant with the Artists' Expedition Society and this idea of artists um, just constantly sort of being on the move, um, whether it be uh, usually it's in our minds, but there you are doing this extraordinary thing, which is actually sort of evolving this expedition into the into the into the middle of well, the middle of nowhere, really. I mean, I guess it's not nowhere if you live there, but um, um, and so um, I wanted to ask you: um, Have you, within your practice, um, you know, you mention uh, uh, sort of? Uh, uh, sky mythologies, celestial mythologies, in relation to the eclipse piece. Um, uh, and clearly, you know, this is stuff that I've sort of read around as well. Um, but have you had the opportunity to travel um, within within your work? Um, and has that sort of fostered um, a, a sort of a broader perspective, do you think? Or sort of nourished the work? Yeah, I think right at the beginning of Lumen, we the thing that excited us most was thinking about how different um, civilizations have understood the sun, moon, and stars throughout time. So um, we've been quite interested in kind of Aztec or Mayan or Egyptian um, understandings of the night sky. Um, yeah, like ancient. Uh, 
beliefs about the sky and that is something that we've really drawn upon um, and particularly as well we have been running a residency in Italy for the past um, five years and it's a the place that we go to is a pretty Roman town called Adina and because of that there's a lot of pagan history around there and specifically to do with Saturn so that has been absolutely fascinating and a lot of the people coming to the residency are from all over the world so they also have these amazing um, stories about uh, the night sky as well. Yeah, I, I think just I think it's great that this sort of dialogue between art and art has so much to bring to astronomy, to science, whatever, and um, and vice versa. It'd be great to chat more. Thank you. Yeah. Sean. Cool. We'll do that sometime. <laughs>